Hi, welcome to East to West WLS, the podcast where we support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. I'm April and I'm the West. And I'm Jason and I'm the East. Today we are joined by our fabulous friend, Michaela. Hi, Michaela. Hello. We are so excited to be welcoming you back to the podcast. You have been a guest a few times now, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really focusing on movement, but really just your bariatric story because what I, what Jason and I feel makes you an amazing friend and bariatric member of our community is that you are just an amazing human, A. B, you are a successful bariatric patient who has kept off a massive amount of weight for years. And you are extremely passionate about supporting the bariatric community, especially in kind of the pillar of movement. That is like your jam. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Movement has been least. huge for me. So yeah. Huge. You you really attribute movement to your long-term success. Honestly, I would say a hundred percent. I'm going to say like 90%. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, but I know you, so that's about right. I totally get that. I totally yeah. get that. So Michaela, before we kind of dive into our conversation, will you just take a, a few moments and introduce yourself to our friends and followers who might not know you? So like, if you want to share how old you are, maybe where you live, when you had your surgery and how much you have maintained your certifications, because you have been moving and shaking girls. So we want to know all about that. And then why you are so passionate about supporting our community. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Michaela Miller, um, AKA losing to blooming on Instagram. Um, I born and raised in Colorado, lived here my whole life, always struggled with my weight. Um, always wanted to be the one to go out and hike and climb and, and, you know, do all these cool adventurous things, but I just didn't grow up in a very active family, very active lifestyle. Like I said, always struggled with my weight, dieted, couldn't keep it off. Like all the diets I tried were extreme. They never teach you how to maintain the weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so eventually uh, I was 25 years old. I was 300 pounds and I was just done. I was sick and tired of watching life pass me by. I was way too young to be living life on a couch like Basically, I was just taking my body for granted. That's the way I look at it is I had this amazing, capable body and I was just letting it wither away and I decided no more. And so I had bariatric surgery in 2016, May of 2016. So I'm about, I'm a little over five years out now. Um, I had BSG. Um, I was 300 pounds and I lost um, I've lost and maintained 150 pounds. I did get, I got down to like 135, but that wasn't a good weight for me. So where I've actually maintained has been around 150. And I actually currently don't know what I weigh right now. I haven't stepped on a scale in months and I, I've actually only stepped on a scale once in the last year and a half. So I don't weigh myself. I don't know what I weigh. All I know is my clothes still fit. I feel good. I'm happy with myself. I can do the things that I want to be able to do with my body now. And that's what I care about. That's why I had my why. That is why I had the surgery. Like that's why I wanted to lose the weight was to be able to actually live the life the way I wanted to live it and use my body the way that it's supposed to be used the way, you know, move it, be active, be able to climb mountains and run races and all the fun things. So So yeah, movement has been really important to me. (laughs) That's that's Um, honestly where I'm trying to get to is the whole no stepping on the scale thing. I'm a daily weigher still to this day. It's very hard to break. It's very hard to break myself from that pattern. But I'm. It means a lot less these days because where it used to control my everyday, my attitude, my habit, my everything was was based on the number I saw in the morning. I'm getting a lot less kind of give a shit about what it says on there and moving more towards the it may not reflect exactly where I thought I was going to be at my journey but at the same time like you said I can move in ways I haven't been able to move in 20 years I can do I can be as active as I want to be I can touch places that on my body I haven't been able to touch in a very long time I can just there's lots of things that I can do and my activity level and my stamina for those activities are so much better than they've been in so long. So for me, 
I, I'm I'm really getting to a point where stepping on the scale is more of a habit than it is something that I feel like I need to do. Well, that's great. That's awesome. And I know there's a lot of people and they say it a lot in the community, like take the emotion out of it, like stop looking at the scale as this emotional thing. It's just data. And I get that. I, I completely get that. But for me, it is emotional. And I maybe now that I haven't stepped on a scale in so long, like it wouldn't be as big of a deal for me, but it's still also like, I've thought about it a lot actually here recently. And it's like, how weird is that? That we weigh ourselves all the time, that we're like so obsessed with how much we weigh. Like our ancestors would look at us and be like, why, why are you weighing yourself all the time? Like, why do you even, I didn't even know what I weighed in 1901 or what, I don't even know, but right? like, like, well, do you remember like way back in the day, you are, you are so right. The only time that you would ever have known what you actually weighed is if you went to the state fair and they had those like, guess your weight things. And you'd step on that big dude chart. I mean, people just didn't have scales in their bathrooms yeah. or in their homes. I mean, they might've had scales on farms, but it was to weigh livestock or hay or beans or who the hell knows what. And now we're doing it every single day or sometimes multiple times a yeah. day. Yeah. Ooh. And Oh, well, Michaela, I got to tell you, one of the most transformational conversations Jason and I have had with anybody in the community is with you. In that first or the second episode that we did with you, you, well, I mean, you, your, your personal weight story is inspiring and very connected, to, I think, to everybody in so many ways. But you said something in one of those episodes, and it has resonated with Jason and I, and it's now part of our vernacular. Your goal is to find your happy, healthy weight. And that is not a weight that is necessarily assigned by the BMI scale. Ooh. And that whole, I'm like, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm just talking about it. But that whole conversation really freed Jason and I from this old mindset that we had about our bodies and our weight and our value. And it allowed us to say, wait a minute, this is my body. This is my life. I get to determine what my happy, healthy weight is. And just because I might still be fat or obese or whatever the term is on the BMI scale, it doesn't actually speak to anything that my body's capable of. And if I'm healthy, if I'm metabolically well, and I weigh 205 pounds, that's what I weigh. And yeah. that has nothing to do with me as a human. I mean, it was just like, it was a mind blowing conversation and you were the one that put it, put it in our heads. And it, it's true. It's absolutely true. It's just, a, it's an amazing freedom. That, that is amazing. And honestly, I do sometimes even in the community, I feel, I shouldn't say I get irritated, but you know, everyone celebrates Wonderland. Well, not everyone hits Wonderland, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they are not a success story. That doesn't yeah. mean that they have not hit a weight that's healthy for them. Mm -hmm. That is their happy weight. Like, so sometimes, you know, and I've worked with a couple clients that, you know, they may they might never see Wonderland. And I've tried really hard to work with them to be okay with that. Like, look, you've lost 200 pounds. You can't, you know, just because you can't lose this last 20 or 30 pounds or whatever you thought that you would be able to hit, you know, whatever this mm -hmm. goal was in your head. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, it's like that 200 pound mark is just like, I don't know, there's uh, yep. this mental thing about it. And, um, but I think it partly is because in the community, it's so celebrated. It's like yeah. Wonderland is the best thing yeah. in the world or whatever. Well, no, the best thing is just to get to a healthy weight that is maintainable. Cause this is the other thing that a lot of people don't realize. I don't freaking care if you can get down to 130 pounds, you mm -hmm. shouldn't care either. What matters is, can you maintain it? Yes. If you can't maintain that, then why does it? matter why if you're miserable like say you're happy and you're healthy and you're doing all the things that you've always wanted to be able to do with your body at 200 pounds but then you kill yourself to get yeah. down to like 160 150 whatever yeah you're gonna have to keep up that level of activity that is probably way too extreme for you probably mm -hmm. like you've probably had well, to go to extremes to get there yeah and well, now you and can't maintain it 
not to mention the eating and the supplements and like all of these things that go into it. I mean, if that is what you enjoy in life, wonderful. But if yeah. you are killing yourself and if you don't want to get up out of bed because you're dreading the day ahead, that's yeah. not a healthy yeah. way to live either. No, no. Well, and no. I'm the, I'm the perfect example of that because originally my goal in my head when I started this whole thing was to get down to lose down to 250 pounds from 468. I was going to lose down to 250 lift my lift back up to 275 and I figured that would be about where I wanted to, to hang out at you know build muscle wise and I am at but I, I bump between 290 and 300 pounds right now and I've been that way for the past probably four months um the only time I got below 290 was when I did the liquid diet again with my wife while she was pre-op and it sucked it sucked ass. Like I was going to the gym. I didn't have the energy I normally had. I didn't have any of the stuff. Like it, it physically killed me just to get down. And the, and the lowest I got even doing that for two weeks was 286. And I was like, well, let's, let's, and, and really April and I really had that conversation talking about that. Like, do I really want to continue doing what I think is going to take for me to get down to 250, just to lift back up to 275 or can I sit here at this 290, 295 mark and lift and continue to shape my body the way I want it to be anyway, if I'm still happy, healthy, metabolically well, my pants fit, my clothes fit, like, no, I, I don't have a six pack. I'm not going to have a six pack. I, I'm the definition of the dad bod. I'm rocking a little pooch, you know, a little pudge in the middle. And you know what? I don't give a shit. Because I don't yeah. look like I did before. My legs don't look like thighs. Yeah. I don't have, you know, I don't have a lot of, the, I don't have any of the issues that I had before. And I'm kind of getting to a point where I'm really cool with that. Like, I don't care yeah. what I look like in pictures. Like, I'm okay to take pictures now. I don't have to hide in the back. Like, all this shit. Like, I'm golden with all of that. Yeah. And I really have kind of gotten to a point where I'm, I'm cool. Like, I'm golden with all that. That is awesome. That's body neutrality right there. And we love that. Yeah. You know, I think we did a whole episode on body neutrality. Another, another mindset shift that just kind of blew both Jason and I and Natalie's brains. We're like, oh my God, this makes way more sense of body positivity. Oh, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Body neutrality. That's oh. where it's at. And that to me is why movement is so important. That's why exercising, working out, like celebrating what your body can do instead of how it looks like that's body neutrality. And that is, that's partly why movement and fitness has been so important to my journey. Um, because I get so caught up in the looks and stuff like that. And, or I used to, and that would lead me down roads that would make me want to self-sabotage because yeah. in this, in extreme weight loss, I don't know. I knew that my body wasn't going to look like a swimsuit model, but I didn't know exactly what my loose skin, like you don't know until you get there, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know what some people think in their minds that their body's going to look like when, when they're done losing weight, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's a mental, it's a mental battle. Sometimes it feels like I've lost all this weight and now I'm still unhappy with my body. I'm still struggling with what I see in the mirror. I'm still um, sad about it. I still feel like I can't wear the swimsuits or the crop tops or the shorts or whatever, you know? And um, some people go the way of plastic surgery. And if that's, you know, your route, that's awesome. Not everyone can afford that. Not everyone wants Want that. I, yeah. I thought I wanted it at one point. I thought that I, I was willing to go in $40,000 worth of debt to have the, the dream body. And that's when I really started working on the body neutrality and the self-love. That's when like a year and a half to two years ago, which is kind of in line with when I stopped weighing myself, um, is when I really started to shift from focusing on what my body looks like and realizing that by doing that, I'm sabotaging things. I'm, I'm sabotaging my progress in the gym. I'm, I'm binging and stuff like that because it's, it just fucks you up in the head. Um, <laughs> and so I shifted my thought process to really just trying to focus on, no, like, why did you have the surgery? You had the surgery. Why did you lose the weight? You lost the weight so that you could go 
do these races, do these hikes, do these amazing things with your body. And now you're able to do that. So focus on that. Like yeah. keep focus on that. Who you don't need to know what the scale says, who can like, you're going to have bad body image days. That's okay. When you have a bad body image day, stay away from the mirror, focus on what your body can do. Like, and that has helped me so much. I literally don't even care what I look like anymore. Like I honestly don't give a shit what I look like anymore. Like I don't even wear makeup as much anymore. I don't, I'll show up to the gym and whatever. I am not one of those girls that's like, I'm going to, I'm going to like get pretty for no, mm -mm. the gym's get, I'm rolling up at five o'clock in the morning. The gym is getting literally morning breath drool out of my mouth, sleep in your eyes, but yeah, smudge is under like whatever probably my top was my pajama shirt like it doesn't match it's like rock on like I smell literally anyone in the gym I am sorry because I know I stink but I don't care I'm here to work that's what I'm showing up for like I just don't even care anymore like I'm human this is a human body and it's been through it's lived life man like mm-hmm. i've got loose skin i've got scars i've got hair i've got body odor like it's human deal with it <laughs> what and all this time we thought you were terminator set from set from the future to help us live our best bariatric lives god damn it Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. Well, that's the whole reason that we're here today is because you, you are our movement guru. We, we have a few movement gurus, but you are one of our favorites. And in September, we're focusing on getting back to basics. And at East to West, we have three pillars of bariatric su- success and their movement, mindset, metabolic wellness. Uh, and because you are such an inspiration in our community, when it comes to movement, we really wanted to connect with you around this, like this idea or concept of getting back to our movement basics, because we, you know, movement is just something that we have to do to live a long, healthy life. And we need to figure out ways to just incorporate it into who we are as as humans, if we want to find that happy, healthy weight. Uh, So today we kind of got four big areas that we want to talk to you about Um, what movement means for a bariatric patient, because we have to acknowledge that it is very different at first. So we really want to talk about that. Uh, We want to talk about why movement is important for lasting success, how we can overcome these common reasons or excuses that we don't incorporate movement into kind of our lives, and then how we can get back to our movement basics. Okay. So yeah, are we, shall we dive in? We ready to do it? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. So Jason, I know this is something you and I've talked about often. I think Michaela, we've talked to you about this, but Right after surgery, uh, Jason and I both experienced this moment of regret, and it was when we kind of got our energy back, and then we went to go do something active, and we felt like we were back in kindergarten, right? Like we couldn't do shit because we had no energy, our muscles were weak. It was awful, right, Jason? I mean, it was like the worst. Yeah, for me, uh, especially because I've always been a very... um lean muscle mass type of person so even though I was really big I was always really strong and had Mm -hmm. a lot of hand strength forearm strength and able to lift and push and do all the things and I noticed as I was losing weight so rapidly even on the pre-op diet all the way down to you know post-op when I because I lost 45 pounds on my pre-op diet so that was a lot of a lot of stuff going there and then post-op I really just started you know kind of it started falling off and then I realized that my grip strength was all but gone completely my forearms yeah. everything had just kind of withered away and I noticed when my wife was even saying it, she was like dude your arms are super small and I'm like I was I was like oh. like how did you <laughs> like I, I was mortified because as a guy that's the last thing you want to hear is that you got small anything so I was like super pissed about that but yeah, even like there was no, like I couldn't do countertop pushups. I couldn't do shit. Yeah. Like I was, I was pretty pissed. Oh dude. I, I committed to a 20 minute ride on my Peloton and after five minutes I had to get off and I was like, <laughs> what have I done? I mean, it was just like, I have totally ruined my fitness, but what, what we don't realize is that 
you have been through major surgery. It's going to take your body for, in a lot of cases, a full year to recover from what you've done to it. It's pissed off because it's either missing something that you were born with, or your plumbing has been rerouted. You've gone through major surgery and you are grieving your old life and your relationship with food. But we're, you know, we like to just put all that to the side and we go, oh my God, this is the worst decision ever because now I can't ride my Peloton or I can't do, you know, push-ups on my countertop. So we're here to tell you that that is a very normal and a very real experience for most bariatric patients. Uh, and movement is going to look different for you after surgery. For me, it looked different up to 18 months after my procedure. And I had to give myself some space and grace around that. But because of conversations with you, Michaela, and others, we've really kind of come to this like definition of movement in East to West. And what we always say is that movement is any type of intentional body movements that are above and beyond your regular daily activity, right? So if you normally go for a five mile walk, that is what you do every day. That's probably not movement for you anymore. That's just a part of your life. Whereas if you have never been a walker, if you've never been to the gym, right? Or you used to do those things and you can't do those things after bariatric surgery, then that is movement for you. So does that kind of align with your definition, Michaela, of movement? Yeah, definitely. And I also wanted to say something on, you know, another reason why we are so weak after bariatric surgery. And honestly, for like the first six months, you're going to struggle with this fatigue, this yes. weakness, whatever you want to call it. We are in an extreme calorie deficit. Okay. Even though our body is metabolizing fat, even though it's, you know, we're using up fat stores, we don't, we're not getting any carbs in, we're not getting like, we are getting high protein in, but still not enough calories to really fuel exercise, like actual training. If you're out there and you're like, oh, I'm going to do bariatric surgery and I'm going to get, I, I've always wanted to do CrossFit. I want to hit CrossFit after bariatric. Oh, mm, not for the first six months. You're not like mm -hmm. you, you're not going to be able to do that for a little bit and that's okay. It's okay. But just understanding that, yes, your body, just like you guys touched on, it is healing. It has been through a lot. You're going through a lot mentally, emotionally, physically. And like I said, you're not getting in any fuel. You are not fueling your body. Your body is not going to want to move and that's okay. Um, but yes, I love your definition of movement. I actually just had a webinar in my like group uh, program talking about this. And I encourage people to use the term movement or activity instead of exercise, because I feel like mm -hmm. exercise has this like negative connotation mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And it honestly stems from diet culture. Like I think a yes. lot of us, we grew up or what, whatever you want to call it, like, you know, we've struggled with our weight for so long and we've done the diets, we've done the extreme exercise programs, but it was only exercise was a punishment. It was, or it was only used for as like the short term solution to get the weight off. Like, oh, I got to get the weight off for this, for this event. Yeah. I got to get the weight off mm -hmm. uh, for this, wedding, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. so you would go to extremes in some crazy exercise program to try to get the weight off. Or you're like, Oh my God, I ate that donut. So I got to go run five yep. more laps. Like, yep. so you're literally only viewing exercise as this negative thing. Of course you don't want to do it. Of course mm -hmm. it's this chore. It's this mental block you have about it. So let's get rid of that word movement doesn't have to be in my, like what I tell my clients and stuff is so kind of what you were saying about that. If you already walk like five miles a day, then you need something more than that. I use step goals for that. So it's like, I tell people if, if you've been getting like 10,000, if 10,000 steps is like your average normal, like that's what you get in your day-to-day -day life. That's normal for you. Mm -hmm. Then that's not a step goal anymore. That's not like you, we need you reaching for a little bit more. Yes. And so, and then that kind of rings into the intentional activity, getting people to move more. So what I tell people is, you know, movement is movement. Don't overthink it. Like we might, you might have some workout in mind, but if you just really can't get yourself to do that workout that day, 
that's okay. Don't, don't look at it though. Is this all or nothing? Like, well, if I'm not going to do the workout, I'm not going to do anything. No, just go walk, go do something that feels better for you that day. Movement is movement. And as long as we're getting consistent, intentional, I like that you said that April intentional movement in yeah. on a yeah. regular basis, we're going to be healthier. We're going to be, we're going to be feeling better. Um, but yeah, right after bariatric surgery, that intentional movement is honestly probably just walking. And that's yeah. all I would recommend. Like just, and especially if you're really new to fitness, if you're someone that really didn't work out at all before surgery, you didn't, you didn't have a workout routine. You didn't have a walking routine. <clears throat> what I just a my movement client, routine. Right? Yeah, like just a, a movement routine. And that's yeah. what I tell my, my clients to start with is let's just start with, you know, 30 minutes or maybe even 20 minutes for some people, 20 minutes a day yeah. for three to five days a week. I want to make that a habit. We're going to make mm -hmm. that a habit of just walking. And then over time, we bump that up. We work on, maybe we increase the time. Maybe we increase how many days a week you're walking. And then once you're ready, now you have this routine in place. And if you're ready to really start incorporating workouts, you have a time slot each day that you're dedicating to walks. You like, you already have that, like I said, that routine down. So yeah. now we can, okay, well, let's, let's put a little 30 minute workout in there in that spot yeah. once you're ready for it. Right. Well, it's good to it's good to hear you talking about it in in those terms of getting people realizing that there's a starting point because you see so many people trying to jump on the yes. next fad like we did when we were still heavy. You see people that I know damn good and well didn't run unless like me, like the only place I ran pre-op was out of snacks. I ran out <laughs> of snacks. I ran out of shit to drink. That's the only run in my ass did before surgery. So I see people that get post-op and they're like, all right, I'm starting 75 hard. And I'm like, the fuck? Like, no, there's no 75 hard for that. What are you not? Like, no, absolutely not. There's no 75 hard right now. Like the yeah. only thing, the post-op 75 days is hard enough. Like I don't need 75 hard exercise on top of that. Like, absolutely not. Like right. you keep all that you, for we, right now. It's not time for that. No, we, we have so much on our mental plate after surgery and on our physical plate after surgery that I think sometimes, you know, getting down on ourselves about not exercising is kind of our old thinking. It's that all or nothing mindset yeah. from our old life. And we're going to use that to yeah. make, to make us feel better with eating food. And yeah. we can't do that because that's living the way that we were living before surgery, after surgery. And if we really want to find this lasting success, we really need to change our mindset when it comes to movement and how we're talking to ourselves and, and, and be real about what we can do where we're at in the moment, right? Because movement is more than just our physical health, right? I mean, like uh, movement has so many benefits for, for our, our minds and our souls, right? Do you guys want to speak to that? Just, just how, how that has added to, to who you are as a person, aside from the physical, you know, benefits? Oh, yeah. Well, like, like we even said in the beginning, you know, to me, movement is, like I said, like 90% of my success is attributed to movement. And a lot of that has to do with the mental and emotional benefits I get from moving. If I'm moving, if I'm getting in my, my workouts, my walks, whatever, I'm feeling better. I have more energy. That's another thing I think a lot of people don't realize is, you know, energy a lot of times comes from activity. Now, again, that's a little different when we're fresh out from surgery, those first few months, you're just going to have low energy in general. Mm -hmm. But if you're sitting there, you're a year out and you're like, Oh, I'm just so tired all the time. I can't move. Like I have no energy to move. Well, you're that energy is going to come from you moving. You need to start moving. You need to get yourself up and get active on a regular basis and you will feel better. You'll have more energy. You'll have better mood. You'll be less stressed. And when I am in that mode, then I take better care of myself. I mm -hmm. eat better. That's why I feel like for me, it all starts with movement because if I'm not moving my body, then I, I am not in a good mental space. I'm mm -hmm. not in a good, like, I, I don't 
um, have as good of nutrition choices and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like I take the best care of myself when I'm consistently moving and routine. I think routines are so important for us. And for me, my movement is a big part of my routine. And so that is also what keeps me going through the day. It's like having that routine in place and, and my nutrition is built around that routine. And so when that is off, everything is off. Like, so yeah, movement, movement is so important. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just, the, the, the picture that just popped into my head, it's like movement is the ignition in a car. And once you start that ignition, it gets all your cylinders moving. Right. And then everything else is kind of firing all cylinders. But if you don't have that initial spark, that initial start point, then the engine's never going, never going to start running. So if yeah. we really think of movement as movement is a thing that you do to get the motivation. This is the big misnomer. People are always like, Oh, I got to wait to be motivated. It's never coming. Let me say this louder. Motivation is never coming. What is coming is you just taking the action is you saying, it doesn't matter that I'm not motivated. If this is something I value, I just need to go do it. But what happens after you do it is you get the motivation to continue to do it. It's like that ignition, that, that consistent routine, that habit is the gas that fuels that car and keeps everything, keeps everything running. Yes. Oh my gosh. I tell my clients all the time. There is no new, there is no motivation fairy. Yes. The motivation fairy is not going to come down and kiss you Mm-mm. on the forehead and Mm-mm. get you off your butt and moving mm-hmm. like you have to move. And it just like you said, so the motivation cycle, you already alluded to it. It is action. So yes. action first, you have That's to get up one. and move. You have to force yourself to move. Then it's results. And results doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, you're losing weight instantly. It results can mean, oh, I felt a little bit better or, oh, I have more energy now or, oh, like, like, so you have action results, then motivation. So motivation is literally the last thing in the cycle. Like, but then that's what keeps, that's what keeps it moving is, but you have to keep acting. Yep. Mine has been really based on results based because I worked out before I got to my heaviest point, I worked about when I was this same weight before probably 17, 18 years ago, I was in the gym, uh, you know, lifted weights, doing uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, all that kind of stuff. Like I did all that all the time back then. And so my body was craving that type of movement and those things. Once I lost all this weight and got down to that weight again, I started getting to the point, I'm like, I need to start doing stuff. Well, going back to the gym really picked up qu- quick for me. So my results came really fast because my body not only was craving it, but my body had been there before. So the more stuff I did, it really started to react pretty quickly. And I'm not really kind of a leg. I, I'm, I, I guess you could say I'm the skipped leg day guy, because when I was 468 pounds, that was enough leg day for me. I carried all this around all the time. So I've done plenty of leg days for right now. Um, so, so I do either my bicep shoulder, let's see, my bicep shoulders and back are my favorite workout days. So I have to get through chest and triceps and all that to be able to get back to my favorite workout day. So that's my motivation to keep going. <laughs> I'm like, I got to get through this bullshit so I can get to my fun day because I love chest shoulders and or my shoulders, biceps and back. So I was like, that was, that's really literally what keeps me going and moving because building my traps and my biceps have been the big, the two biggest things that are just eating it up right now. So every day I go and can do that and process the, you know, the results that I'm having, it's, it just kind of keeps it moving for me. Yeah, Yeah. but Jason, your, your story so, so beautifully highlights the fact that we can all use different strategies, right? So what works for you, Michaela, might not be what works for Jason and what works for Jason might not be what works for somebody else. But if we are listening to others movement stories, how did they get started, right? How do they keep going on the days that they don't want to? We're, we're going to be able to pull something from Jason's movement recipe and your movement recipe and go, you know what, I'm going to try that. Or I'm going to think about this in a different way. We, we've heard this information a thousand times. We yeah. just have to hear it from the right person or in the right tone or in the right setting for it to really click and, and resonate. Yeah. And I think that's, that's why it's so important that we share how we move and what we, and how we think about movement. 
Yeah. Well, and Michaela's one hundred percent right because when I on the days that I'm going to the gym, when I'm really going and hitting and doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing, I don't yeah. come home and eat crap because I'm like I just went in and put all that work in. Why would I just throw it all away right now? So I eat better. But on the days that I you know have rest days or take breaks or just kind of talk myself out of going, those are the days I usually lay around and will eat worse than I did if I was to go. So yeah. you know, if, if I can keep myself on a semi-normal routine and take, take, you know, less rest days, but let's be honest, I'm old. So my body's kind of like, hey, stupid, you can't move like that every single day. Because when I first well, started back in the gym, I was like seven days, hit it hard, no rest, but like going and trying to do all the things. And my body was like, <laughs> no, aren't you no. cute? Look at your old ass in here trying to go seven days. <laughs> and I tried to crawl out of bed and was like, oh, God. My wife was like, what's the matter with her people? And I'm like, shut up, it hurts. Everything hurts. No, no, no. We need rest days. Like, I'm big yeah. on rest days. Your body has to recover. Rest days are important. But I'm also really big on active rest days. So for me, a rest day, like, there's a difference between a rest day and a lazy day. <laughs> rest day for me is I'm still getting my steps in. I'm still, I still have like a intentional movement block. I still, I go for a walk. I do stretching. I do mobility, something like that. Um, but every once in a while, we also need a lazy day where we just literally don't do everything, anything, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I think we like, I think that's something else in the community, which we kind of already talked about is people go to extreme they get way too extreme almost right out of the bat it's this all or nothing thinking which yes. then again creates this whole mindset of like exercise is punishment exercise is terrible i hate it um and and then if they take a rest day if they take a day off because they really need it um they feel so guilty and i used to struggle with that i used to struggle with that guilt and i used to struggle with feeling like oh my God, you know, it's so crazy the things your minds will do. Because I remember back early on in my journey, when I would take a rest day, I swear I would see a bigger person in the mirror that day. Like I felt bigger. I, I felt like I looked bigger. Like my mind played such horrible mean games with me. Mm. And now what I have taught myself in my five years of my journey, I think this is one of the biggest lessons I've learned. And what I try to like really nail home to people is consistency, not perfection. You don't have to work out every single day. You don't have to eat perfect every single day. There is room for the lazy days. There's room for the rest days. There's room for time off. Like you need a break every once in a while and it's not going to derail your progress. It is not going to throw anything off. I have had so many off days, slump days, bad eating days, no activity days, like, you know, and look, I'm still successful. And I think that that, because how do I, I'm struggling with the phrasing, but I think one of the most um, sabotaging things in this journey is when we get that guilt and shame going, and then it sends us down that spiral. It sends us down mm -hmm. that, um, that hole. And that's when mm -hmm. we start to eat more. That's when we start to feel like, fuck it. I'm just going to throw it. Like I've screwed up at everything. Anyways, I'm just going to throw it all away now. You know, yes. it's the guilt, it's the shame. So you yes. have to realize that one or two days here and there, it's not going to hurt anything. Please stop guilting yourself. Please stop feeling shameful, dust it off, brush it off, realize you're human and just keep going. I, you look at these fit spos out there, you look at these fitness influencers, whatever. I don't know if you'd consider me one or not. I struggle labeling myself anything. So, but just know that you see these people, you see their workouts online, you see them showing the healthy things they're eating. They have so many off days. Like they probably just came out of a one month depression slump. Like yeah. don't just keep going okay like we yes. all struggle we're all human and 80 20 did you know that with the 80 20 rule 
that's 75 days a year that you have to totally fuck it up, okay? 75 days a year, you can, that's two and a half months that you could literally like spread out throughout a year, that you could like, screw up, have an off day, have a slump, whatever, and you will still be successful. You will still be consistently on track. Oh my, I'm like, my mind is blown. You just straight tectonically shifted something in my frontal cortex lobe, whatever the (laughs) hell that's called. She's carrying up all the days she took on her off on her off time just now, going, Oh fuck, I still got 12 days left. <laughs> <I'm laughs> this whole summer. <laughs> maybe that, maybe that. But I mean, I but know. holy Go ahead. Oh, what's the I, I, I mean, shit. I'm just like, oh my fucking god. When you put it that way, like I could sit on my ass for two and a half months, and if I just hit it hard for the rest, I mean. Two and a half months, that's a long time. That's and a I long guess, time. yeah, and I guess what, what that gives me is the grace to know that I don't have to be perfect every single day. And, and it's okay to have a day or two that I'm just like, you know what? I am not there. And that's yeah. okay because I've got 75 flipping days to do that with. Well, and that's what I literally try to like, Literally, sometimes we talk about a day, you know, oftentimes it's like, if you had a bad day, dress, brush it off. I can't stress enough to you guys. I have had bad months in my five years. Mm -hmm. I have had months, like a month period. Usually it hits sometime in the winter because I have seasonal depression, but where I don't hardly work out, I don't eat as great. Like it just happens. And yet, I'm still successful on my journey. I'm still here. I'm still going. I'm still. So that is what I'm really trying to get people to understand is like, just stay consistent. Just, and consistency means it doesn't mean that you don't have off days. It just means that you just keep going. Like you just keep trying, you keep learning, you keep trying, you keep pushing forward. Um, You don't let a, a couple bad days or a week or maybe a month completely just send you into a downward spiral where you give up everything. Um, well, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine today who's pre-op and he was, we were talking about that back and forth because he still got a couple of, he still got a, about a month or so before he's even on his pre-op diet, but we got to talking about it and I said, you know, he was, he was asking me about staying motivated, go to the gym and those kind of things and, you know, kind of how it all works out. And I'm like, well, I was like, I explained to him like this. I was like, we are the greatest salespeople when it comes to ourselves, we can talk ourselves into or out of anything. I was like, we could sell a glass of water to a drowning man when it comes to talking ourselves out of doing anything. I was like, so mm-hmm. don't, or you can like talk. That's not- yeah, talk yourself into pizza, talk yourself into Dairy Queen. No problem. And that's what I told him. I was like, you know, I can talk myself out of gym days real well. I was like, so, but that was like, what really happens is, is you have to realize that you're not going to be as successful or do these things without sticking to a program. It's going to be your eating program, your workout program, the water program, the protein program. I was like, it's all about programs and it's what you subscribe to, you know, post op as to how this works for you. I was like, you can go in and say, well, I really am only going to go, you know, have pizza post-op and that's going to be my only thing. You know, I was like, and you're just going to run yourself right into the ground. I was like, or you can follow on the, you know, high carb, do these things, you know, or no carb and high protein and all the things that we need to do to be successful. And it's going to work out really well for you. I was like, being a man, you're already on your way to having a more successful journey than most people anyway, because we lose weight faster and easier Mm -hmm. than women. I was like, now you can still screw that up very easily. I was like, but as long as you're committed to doing the right things and making the right choices, I was like, it's going to go very well for you. So, you know, but, but it was just a simple thing of, yeah, we're the best salesman when it comes to our, so we can talk ourselves out of doing anything or into anything. 
Yeah. Well, and, and this is a, a perfect segue into, into the other thing that we really want to talk about, which is excuses, right? Or the reasons that we can't move. And like you said, Jason, we really are the best salesmen, you know, either for or against ourselves. And the three big reasons that I say to myself, and that I know that other people in the community say is that I just don't have the time or, well, I have limited mobility or I'm scared of the gym or I absolutely hate the gym. So what can we do, Michaela, to talk ourselves into choosing into our movement instead of choosing out of it? So first thing is, you know, time. I feel like time, that is, everyone struggles with that. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're new to movement, you've never had a workout routine, you've never had a movement routine, um, you know, that's where you need to start. You need to just start building a simple movement routine, kind of like what we alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. And if you're sitting there and like, I just don't even know when I would fit it into my day, you need to take a time journal basically, or I, I, I don't think that's the technical word for it, but basically what you do is throughout your day for a few days, you're writing down every single thing you do and what time you're doing it. And that includes if you're just sitting there on your phone for two hours, or if you're sitting watching TV with the family for two or three hours in the evening, you're writing that down. And then you're finding those time gaps throughout your day of like, oh, I could totally fit a 20 or 30 minute um, movement in here or there, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, or very common. It's like, well, I have the kids, like I have to take care of the kids and well, get the kids moving with you. That really is literally no excuse. Like when people tell me like, I can't work out and I know, yes. In an ideal world, your movement time would be just you time. And, but if you don't have that option, that doesn't mean that you still can't get movement in. You can definitely still move. You should be getting your kids active, get them involved, do some little, go for a walk together, play with them. Again, don't overthink the movement. Movement is movement. As long as you're moving your body for 20 to 30 minutes, like you're setting a timer, it's intentional. You're keeping yourself moving, dance around your living room. Literally sometimes Scott and I, when we are in our lazy mode, but we still need to get movement in, we will put on one of our favorite movies and we will put together like a little workout challenge for that movie. So it's like one time we did Harry Potter. So every time someone said Harry Potter's name, we had to do like five squats. Every time Dumbledore like did, I don't know, something like we had to do some sit-ups. Like it doesn't have to be anything rigid or extreme. Just move your body. Stop making excuses. Stop overcomplicating it and just move. Um, I think that's where a lot of people get worried about it or nervous about it is they think, well, it's got to be a complete routine. It's got to be a start to finish. It's got to be two hours long. It's got to involve this, this, and this. If I don't have a Peloton, then it's not going to work. If I don't have this or I don't have the right equipment, yeah. I don't have, and people don't realize you can do body weight exercises with literally your body and your limbs. Yeah. And I yeah. used to do I used to do bench press with my daughter when she was five. I used to do curls with her when she was yeah. five. I worked yeah. out using her body weight and my body weight. I did push ups with her on my back. Like we did all those things when I, she yeah. was growing. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it, no, <laughs> that's that's the all or nothing mindset. And the all or nothing mindset or perfectionist mindset, which I get it. I've been there. I used to be that person. But let me tell you right now, if you cannot get past that mindset, you will not be successful long term because you will burn yourself out or you will keep making these excuses for not being able to get anything done, anything because you're you're going to continue looking for the perfect time, mm-hmm. the perfect mm-hmm. place, the perfect routine, whatever it is, stop looking for that. It's analysis paralysis, right? Like, yeah, you, you want to, you want to plan everything out. You want to make sure everything's great. I want to find the perfect thing. Well, in that quest for the perfect thing, you're not doing anything. Yeah. You're just, you're just spinning your wheels. Right. Yeah. And, and and it keeps bubbling up to the top for me. I just keep saying it, but it's like, that's your old way of thinking. Yeah. And, and I feel like a broken record saying it, but you really do have to change almost every aspect of your life 
after bariatric surgery, because if you don't, you are going to weigh what you weighed after surgery before surgery, right? Yes. Like, yes, your, because you, your weight is representative of the lifestyle that you are willing to live. So that's yeah. why I try to tell people to focus on your goal lifestyle instead of your goal weight, because yes. if you like, you have to work on getting the lifestyle down, the habits down, the, yeah. Cause again, just like what you're saying, April, if you don't focus on rearranging your lifestyle and creating mm-hmm. better habits, then first of all, you're going to weigh what you used to weigh with your old mm-hmm. lifestyle, but also to the opposite end of that, if you go too extreme and you're just focused on weight, which what we talked about earlier, yeah, then you're, you're going to get burnt out and you're not going to be able to maintain that. And then you're going to feel like a failure. The weight's going to yep. come back on and mm-hmm. you're going to be lost. So yeah. you need to focus on lifestyle and yep. movement that feels good for you. What again, stop overthinking it. What I do for movement, that's probably too extreme for a lot of people. And that's mm-hmm. okay. You do not have to do what I do for movement to be no. successful, to be no. healthy. Yep. You need to find what is maintainable and enjoyable for you. And as far as like mobility as an excuse, again, not an excuse. I'm sorry. None of the, like, there's literally not a good excuse out there. <laughs> so well, we, a couple of months ago, we focused on, or, or we had a lot of questions about limited mobility. There's a lot of people in our community that do, that are limited in their movement. And we yeah. acknowledge that we, we recognize that. Yes. And we celebrate yeah. the fact that even though you're limited, you're saying, but I want to do more. We have a ton of resources on our website that only speak to limited mobility. And the thing that's really powerful about our definition of movement and how we're talking about movement is movement is where movement meets you where you're at. So let's say you have a difficult time getting out of a chair. Let's say that you need the assistance of a walker or a cane, or you're in a wheelchair. There are movements that you can do that push you just a little bit beyond what you can do today that are safe for you. That is movement, my friends. Do not say that you are not moving. You are moving. If you're doing just a little bit more than what you can do, if you're pushing yourself. So if your goal is, I want to be able to get up out of my chair without using extra assistance. Freaking rad. That is movement for you. Like celebrate that. Do that. That is, that is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about you going from having a difficult time walking to running a marathon. That's not what we're saying. You've got to start where you're at. And just yeah. remember, stop overthinking it. Movement is movement. Don't yes. don't think just because, like you said, I can't go to the gym or I can't do these other things that you yeah. can't do anything because you yeah. absolutely can do something. You can do something from a chair. You can do something. Um, you can modify almost yes. any workout out there. Yes. So you can do it. And then, you know, the gym intimidation, that's huge. That's huge for a lot of people. I literally Mm -hmm. still struggle with gym intimidation at the CrossFit gym. Like I still struggle with that. And I've been going there for over a year. Like, Mm -hmm. um, but you know, first of all, you don't need a gym to move. Mm -hmm. You don't need a gym. Um, so again, not really a good excuse to not move. Um, and, eventually, you know, if you're getting to a point though, where you're like, well, cause this is the way I look at it is you have to figure out what your true goal is in your journey. If your goal truly is just to be healthier and more active, to be able to move better, to have more energy, then you really just do need daily movement. You really mm-hmm. just do need some daily activity. It doesn't have to be like a rigorous training program or, or anything yeah. structured really yeah. like that. You just need to make sure that you're moving your body intentionally on a daily yeah. basis. But if your goal actually is that you want to be able to, you know, maybe run a certain race or be able to lift certain weights or whatever that is you might eventually have to get to the gym because fitness, fitness is what you train for. Fitness is what you work out for. That is why you work out. You work out to build fitness, to build strength. You Mm -hmm. move for general health, wellness abilities. But if you really want to work on fitness, you will have to get 
to a gym eventually, unless you have a really awesome home setup. Um, but just know that first of all, it's going to be uncomfortable when you first join, um, look into getting a personal trainer at the gym. That's going to make yeah. you feel a lot better. They're going to yep. teach you the equipment. They're going to, um, guide well, you around. Of, They're going to make a lot of gyms. Don't they do like a, like an intro session, right? Like you sign up with yeah. your membership and they're like, Oh, Hey, you get to meet, you know, one or two hours with one of yeah. our coaches and we'll show you how to do all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can that, take advantage of that. Great. Yeah, yeah. Take advantage of that. Um, but just know that I think we we're all afraid of those like gym bullies. We're afraid of getting made fun of or afraid of someone judging us, whatever. Honestly, that happens so little. It happens enough to where we hear about it and we see it and it's horrible and it breaks our hearts and we don't want to be that person either. And it puts that fear in our mind, but it honestly, the majority of the time, the people there at that gym, they don't care about you. They're there for them. They're focused on their goals. They're focused on themselves. They don't care what you're doing. They don't care what you're wearing. They don't, you know, you need to be there focused on you and your goals. You deserve to be there. You have just as much of a right to be there as anyone else. We mm -hmm. all start somewhere. There was a quote that I saw that has always kind of stuck with me. And it is what helps me when I kind of get in that mindset with the CrossFit gym. And it said something, uh, don't be afraid to suck at something new. We all have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. We all suck in the beginning. So I know that in the gym, you're going to be surrounded by some lunks and some like fitness pros and stuff. But just remember, they started somewhere too. And if someone's going to judge you for where you're starting, then that's a them problem. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, what is wrong with them? Like, mm -hmm. dude, right? what is wrong with you? You know? Yep. <laughs> well, and, and I, I really appreciate this discussion because it just goes back to as much as movement is a part of our, of who we want to become, it really does start in our mindset. We have to shift our mindset. We kind of have to get out of our old way of thinking. We have to focus on what we value and we need to find something that works for us at this moment, at the present moment, not who we were, not who we want to become, but who we are right now. And if we can build that habit, like Jason was talking about, we can build that routine, right? What you were talking about, Michaela, we can, we can get to a place where that movement really does become the spark in our bariatric engine. And it really will power all these other things that we want to accomplish. But if we think of movement as a joyous thing and not a punishment, we're really going to, we're really going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And also wow. I think like, Cause I am, you know, five years out maintenance is hard. Maintenance gets very, uh, you don't have the goals anymore. You're, you're not losing weight. You're not like there's the excitement is gone. The, you need goals. And that's the other reason why I'm so passionate about fitness. I love fitness. I need it in my life because that's, what's going to, it's not the only thing keeping me going, but it's one of the big things keeping me going is yeah. my fitness goals and things that I want to accomplish, um, my strength goals, things like that. It's like, that gives me something to work towards. That is what kind of like what Jason was saying. It gets me up because I'm not motivated. I don't want to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go work out. That is literally the last thing I want to do at five o'clock in the morning because I'm not a morning person. I want to sleep for three more hours. So I do not want to go to the gym, but I'm getting up and I'm going anyways, because like I said, my goals, my movement fitness goals are very based on like the races and things like that, that I want to do. Maybe that's mm -hmm. not what you want to do. So you need to figure out what your actual goals are, what you want out of life, what you want your lifestyle to look like, and then find the movement that fits within that. And that feels right. And be okay with starting at the very basic, basic level in the beginning. And then you will grow on it from there, but don't go balls to the walls, crazy 
all, like all or nothing in because you're going to burn out. You're going to feel like a failure and it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. Then you're going to be hitting me up like, Michaela, I'm, I'm working out a million times a week and I'm doing all this and all that. And I just can't do it anymore. And, and the weight has plateaued because the weight's going to plateau. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give it all up. And it's like, oh my gosh, well, you're doing too much. You started too fast, too soon. Like, yeah. calm down a little bit. That's the other thing. Sorry. I know we probably got to wrap up. <laughs> Don't well, we'll take all your time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't overstress your body in the beginning. I think that's another uh, thing is, um, you know, working out is great and it is important for weight loss and it is important for weight maintenance um or not just working out but movement in general um but kind of what we were talking about in the beginning is especially when we're newer out from surgery don't overstress your body with the movement mm -hmm. because that can cause more plateaus if you're stressing your body it's already stressed out it's already freaking out like you need to ease into it and all like that, but we need a place to build from. It's kind of like, um, so when we're on our weight loss journey, we're going to hit metabolic adaptation, which is where our metabolism is slowed down because we're in this low calorie deficit for so long. We've lost so much weight. We're not burning as many calories anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to be able, and that's typically when you're going to start to stall, that's when you're going to start to yep. hit plateaus. If you oh, want girl. to be able to continue <laughs> losing weight, we, first of all, we can't really cut calories any lower yeah. because we're bariatric patients. We can't mm -hmm. like, we don't have much room to work there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to break a stall, to break a plateau, it's going to really be about kind of messing with movement and seeing if we can increase movement somewhere, somehow, if you've already started at the beginning of your journey with some crazy, like I'm getting 15,000 steps a day and I'm doing all this crazy stuff, then we don't have much to work on there either. Once you're at this plateaued point, because now your body has adapted to that movement level that you have been putting it under. Oh, um, yeah. Your body adapts to the demands that you have been putting it on for a certain amount of time. That's why we have to, over time, if you want to continue losing weight, and this is why this is kind of important, we have to increase the activity. We either have to increase like how active you're being or the intensity of your activity or um, changing up your, your modes of activity. Um, but again, we don't want to go too extreme because then that's not maintainable for you. But yeah. if you're already going to extreme and now you've plateaued, we literally, we don't have much room to, to mess with there. We, we don't have, uh, I'm not going to make you get 20,000 steps in, in a day. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and I, I guess I kind of learned that and Jason, I, you've talked, you and I've talked about this, uh, quite a bit. I just wasn't called to move my body for a very long time after surgery. Yeah. And I fought and fought and fought that. And Wendy, my therapist was like, but why? Like you're, you're healthy. Your numbers are great. Like you've been to the doctor, everything's fine. Like, I don't understand why you're battling against this. Like you will get to it when you're ready to. And Jason, I've talked about like, he's you, Jason, you've just started to become active and you're getting close to a year out of surgery, right? Yeah. I, I really started kind of home training with a couple of barbells and some resistance bands and stuff about six and a half to seven months out. And really kind of created a home routine for myself to do a few nights a week. And then got to the point where that stuff got really super easy for me to do, where it was the struggle at the beginning. And that's when I knew I had to alternate it to something different, which is when I joined the gym by the house and started going there. And then initially have finally went in like way too hard, like I said. And then now I'm to the point now where I'm, I'm just kind of easing into a very normal routine about three days a week. Yeah. Well, and it's, 
I think for, for both you and I, like we had so much to not to overcome, but to like work through on just the mental side of our bariatric, like macro journey, like, you know, just figuring out the food stuff that it was too much for us to do it together. But now, you know, I'm two years out, you're getting up to one year, Michaela, you're five years out. So, yeah. you know, you could, you kind of like master the food stuff and then you're ready to take something else on. So don't feel like I have to do all of these things all at once, fresh out of surgery. No, nope, you got to slow roll into this. Give yourself yeah. that space and grace to figure this out and to reestablish your life as a bariatric patient, because that's how you're going to find long-term success. And exactly as you said, Nikayla, the weight, it, you will stop losing weight. You will reach your happy, healthy weight. So you're going to need some new goals, some new things to focus on to help, to help carry you into this new chapter of your life, because this, you know, the, the weight is going to stop. You're going to find your size. You're going to find your weight and that's going to be it. And if you don't yeah. have something else to focus and work towards, that might feel a little bit like, you know, deflating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, oh my gosh, girl, this conversation has blown my mind. And I don't, I can't tell you how many ways I was literally, I've got like this book. I got my notebook text me and I'm like frantically trying to write stuff down. <laughs> God damn. I'm going to be making, I don't know how many graphics out of this conversation. <laughs> As always, friend, we are enlightened and inspired by what you have to share with this community. We value your time so much. We know that you're extremely, extremely busy. You, you've got a regular job. You have a thriving coaching business. You're leading this movement challenge. If people want to follow you, where can they connect with you? So Losing to Blooming on Instagram at Losing to Blooming. Um, I'm working on a website that's coming soon. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, and you know, we talked a little bit about it. I do work with clients on this stuff all the time. Um, we are in the middle of a challenge right now. I'm going to be rolling that into um, like a membership here soon. That's going to be a group coaching membership where there will be uh, workouts for all fitness levels available. So that's coming soon. It's not available yet, but working on that. And then um, I have a six month program that's going to be launching um, next month. And that is for pre bariatric patients, helping guide them literally through the entire process. So pre op into their post op journey through their post op journey, if they want it, I have a client right now, I've been with her since she was like three months pre op. And now she's about three months post op. Um, and I'm probably going to be with her through, I could see working with her through her whole journey. Like we just, it's a great client relationship and, um, and yeah. And so that's what my program is literally built on and creating workouts for you or a movement program routine for literally every stage of the way, working on nutrition, working on the mindset, working on movement. Um, and that's, that's just what, what we do. So that's that program, like I said, launching next month, but, um, but yeah, that's exciting things in the works. And, um, I could literally talk about movement all night because like we said in the beginning, it's, I, for me, it's been one of the most important parts of my journey. And it literally, I think it's partly because my why is built around movement. Like, yeah. I wanted to summit mountains. I wanted to do the obstacle course races. I wanted like, mm -hmm. that is my why. And mm -hmm. that's what keeps me going. So find your why well, you need a why. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? And your, your Instagram feed is so uplifting because you so expertly tell your story and explain your why, and then show you doing those things. I love seeing you summit. I love seeing you hiking. I love seeing you sitting in front of the mirror with that excess skin hanging out. Like you were just saying, nope, this is why I did this. And this is how amazing life can be on the lighter side. Right. And, it, and yeah. if you can do it, anybody can do it. And that's, what's, that's, what's just so encouraging and, and uplifting and inspiring all three of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, we're so happy and, and excited and honored to be able to call you a friend. Thank you so very much for, for joining us today. Like I said, we know your time is valuable, but we are so excited to pass your wisdom on to our bariatric community. No, I love it. I would, anytime you guys want me on, I'm honored to be here. So thank oh, you girl. guys so much. You might be regretting that, but we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, my friend, you want to take us out? Yes, ma'am. Thank you to every, uh, Michaela. Thank you again. Like uh, April said, your knowledge and wisdom and time are all very much appreciated. 
I uh, want to thank everybody for continuing to like, share, follow, subscribe, tell your friends to tell their friends, to tell anybody to please follow, like, share, subscribe as well. Uh, we would not be able to do what we do without you guys. Uh, please leave us podcast rate, uh, ratings on your favorite podcast player. You can leave us ratings and reviews on YouTube as well. Um, you can also go to Anchor and leave us shout outs where we can add you into future episodes of the podcast, which is another amazing thing that we have. And then mm -hmm. April, you want to tell them about uh, becoming a patron? We do have an amazing, thriving Patreon community. If you love the support that you get here at East to West, you can actually help us keep the lights on, so to speak. Your, your monthly contribution helps us pay for Zoom. It helps us uh, pay for all of these, the technologies and the websites that we use to actually produce the podcast. So we'd very much appreciate your support if you would like to become a patron. And we thank you with like little special events, special trackers. We we try to, to really thank our patrons in little extra special ways. So just head to Patreon dot com slash east to west wls to find out all about our patreon and uh, just remember at the end of the day you've got this we've got you and we'll see you next time bye 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 thanks friend bye